This is our second part of the Cheshireton talk, um, dealing now with uh, the main topic for this for this particular um, segment is what exactly is Cheshireton saying about Christianity? What separates it um, from other religions uh, during its time and after? It is the second of Chesterton's two major points. The first point we discussed last week, which was Chesterton's, um, some would say, challenge to H.G. Wells's idea that as you go through society, go through history, I should say, if you progress and advance further and forward, things get better. There is a marked improvement in quality throughout history, beginning from earlier to later. Chesterton, of course, would challenge this and say that occasionally there are moments in history um, especially regarding the war between Carthage and Rome, where history almost has to um, field, if you will, a, a bit of a corrective to itself. There's something that needs to be addressed. There's something that, the, that something goes off the rails and therefore needs to be sort of pulled back into the human sort of a, that narrative of history. Now we're going to focus on the second part of Chesterton's thrust in this book, The Everlasting Man, which of course is what separates Christianity, what makes it distinct. Um, from other religions and just in and of itself. Uh, just as far as uh, MO and how this is going to go, similar to um, how I always present, uh, I'll be showing you art. I'll be reading you um, from Chesterton's text, and I'll be showing you different pieces of art, uh, ranging from perhaps Renaissance art. Um, I have some, today I have something from the 14th century as well, which is the sort of early Renaissance, sort of mid late medieval period, and also something from the looking at dates, so oh, well, about 200 years ago, so something rather recent in comparison to things we examine uh, with regards to art in, this, uh, in these talks. Why I do this, this is an homage to an old Yulo family friend, uh, the Jesuit educator James Donnellan, who um, worked in the Philippines. He was an American Jesuit who eventually went on to um, get his, uh, further his studies in Oxford University, England. He was an English lit scholar and used to give these masterful lectures in the Philippines uh, when I was a, a young boy and watch him give these. And basically he'd show slideshows of his travels through Europe. And he'd show you, for instance, a sculpture from Donatello and tell you all the aesthetic information that you need to know about that, but also place it in its time in history. Why is it important? What were the things going on at this time in history? What were the, so the socio-political issues surrounding this time? So it's my small homage to that. That's what I tried to bring in um, with regards to these book readings. Okay, so let's recap from the last point of last week. Um, which was, of course, the great war between Rome and Carthage, uh, where you have essentially two forms of pagan, uh, of the pagan world clashing with Rome, uh, fighting, of course, in three Punic Wars versus Carthage, and finally coming out triumphant, of course, uh, destroying Carthage in the process. Chesterton makes a point that it was important for Rome to win. It was important for Rome to win because Christianity had to develop it, sort of, if you will, if it was born, it had to be born in the world of Rome rather than in the milieu of Carthage. If it had started off at Carthage, uh, things may not have been uh, as, uh, how should we say, as, uh, as they turned out to be. So Christianity found a more um, ready atmosphere and civilization with regards to Rome. Now, going from there, Chesterton will bring up the very beginning of his second part of his book, what exactly is interesting, but very, very almost shocking about, uh, about Christianity as a religion. And if I could draw your attention, I'll, I'll be reading from this on page 169 from the Chesterton text. Uh, this is my Ignatius Press copy. <clears throat> from the second part of the book, which of course is uh, the God in the cave on the man called Christ and on the God in the cave is the very first page you see once you open there. Uh, if you scroll down to the second full paragraph on page 169, <clears throat> you'll find an interesting sentence. And Chesterton, Chesterton again, is, ver is a very interesting man to read. He does not write like an academic. He writes in many ways like an artist, which of course he did study. Uh, he did study art in, in his younger life. Um, from the first, from this, um, Second full paragraph, beginning with a mass of legend, if you guys are there. A mass of legend and literature, which increases and will never end, has repeated and rung the changes on that single paradox. That the hands that had made the sun and the stars were too small to reach the huge heads of the cattle. That the hands that had made the sun and the stars were too small to reach the huge heads of the cattle. 
I'd like you to think about that sort of imagery using, of course, a Chesterton bringing up the significance of Bethlehem and the significance of uh, God made flesh being born in a manger, the most humble uh, of environments. If you go over to the next couple of pages, this, you'll see a passage that ties into that. This is in page 171, uh, again from Chesterton, Ignatius Press copy. Uh, from page 171, middle of the first full paragraph that begins with here begins. If you scroll down <clears throat> roughly the middle of that paragraph, there you'll find the sentence beginning with you cannot. You cannot chip away the statue of a mother from all around that of a newborn child. You cannot suspend the newborn child in midair. Indeed, you cannot really have a statue of a newborn child at all. Similarly, you cannot suspend the idea of a newborn child in the, in the void or think of him without thinking of his mother. You cannot visit the child without visiting the mother. And you cannot in common human life approach the child except through the mother. So with this in mind, I'd like to screen share right now from our presentation. <clears throat> This is a painting um, found at the Legion of Honor Museum in San Francisco. One of the uh, nice perks about being in the city. It's a great museum. I constantly plug it. I'm very fond of the Legion of Honor Museum here in the city. This is a painting by Jacopo Robusti, also known as Tintoretto, one of the great Venetian painters uh, of the Renaissance. Uh, it is, of course, a Madonna and child. A little bit more detail on that in a second. Um, but let me go over something that tries to put paraphrasing what Chesterton is saying in those first few lines of text that I read. <clears throat> Christianity, he's saying, is unique, not only because the logos, the word of God literally, came into the world, but also because he chose to come in the most innocent and vulnerable form. We see this, of course, quite starkly uh, in this painting. But he came, as we know, to die for humanity, but there's often something forgotten or neglected when we think of Christ dying for humanity. Um, if we think of Good Friday, I can honestly say as a philosophy professor, it is one of the things that has always staggered me in terms of just simply thinking about it, that if you had an all-powerful being that is being itself, that is pure existence and pure power, for that being to somehow come into our plane of existence, go through the suffering on Good Friday, in an effort to save us from our own sins, not for his sins. It, it, it frankly boggles the mind. It, it boggles this philosopher's mind. I can't even wrap my mind around it. it. It's just an act of such supreme selflessness and such goodness and such empathy. And the empathy part I'm going to tie into here, not only is the Logos coming into this world to die for human beings, to die for people, but he's also coming to live with people. It's not only the for part. It's also the with part. And the with part, I think, is, the, is what Chesterton is really trying to get in the second part of his book. So focusing on the painting again, uh, this is by the Venetian Tintoretto. Um, roughly year, the years given for the painting, 1570 to 1572. So roughly 16th century uh, Venetian art, right when we're moving from Renaissance art into mannerism uh, as a style. Um, Tintoretto is, uh, was an apprentice of the very famous Venetian paint, painter Titian, who we'll see in a little bit. Titian is one of the greats, of course, of, uh, of Renaissance art. There was a Renaissance art theorist who wrote of Titian, Tintoretto's teacher, saying that Titian was the sun amidst smaller stars in the realm of painting, not only in Italian art, but also art all around Europe at that time. What made Tintoretto unique and quite different from his teacher, Titian, is that Tintoretto was more of a, in very plain sort of way, way of saying it, he was more of an everyman type painter. He had a very approachable style. Titian was very grand, a very powerful, very nuanced at the same time. But you could see in Tintoretto, the man, Tintoretto, Jacopo Robustis, his empathy for the lower classes in society. When we look at Tintoretto paintings, they almost look 
I, I, I kind of caution myself by using too strong a word, but they almost look rough. Tintoretto in many ways, uh, if you think of that old poem by Robert Frost of when you're walking in the woods on a snowy evening, let's just say you're walking in those woods and you find a very comfortable inn that has a warm fire and you sit down and you have a very simple meal, but it's very delicious and very hearty. I, I often think of that when I see Tintoretto. He has this very rustic, uh, this very sort of earthy uh, feel to his paintings. He was known for not being, uh, when you look at his paintings, for not being overly, uh, for not overly emphasizing what the Vini, what the Florentines, I should say, uh, the Florentine school of art would in having very clearly delineated lines. If we look at the arm of the baby Jesus right here, you don't really see a clear sort of almost black or outline separating it uh, from the hay or from the blue cloak of, of the Virgin. Uh, this style is called non finito. In Italian, it means almost not finished, not, not completely finished. Of course, there were crit critics of this style. Uh, Michelangelo himself, who is from Florence, uh, will say when he sees the work of Titian, who is, of course, Tintoretto's teacher, uh, Titian, who is the great Venetian painter, Michelangelo was known to, to have said uh, that it was nice, to, it, was, it was too sad that the Venetians never learned to draw. The Venetians were very good at paint. Uh, very good at using paint on canvas. Please note the weather in Venice and the nature of being around water makes frescoes very difficult, like literally painting on stone or on buildings like you see in Florence. Uh, you, you really have to paint on canvas uh, with regards to Venetian painting. So with regards to this non finito or sort of a more simple, simple style, it really fits, I would say, the, the thrust of the painting. When we look at it, we have the traditional red and blue worn by the Virgin. Uh, the blue, of course, and this, by the way, stretches back to Byzantine art, uh, several hundred years before the Renaissance. The blue, of course, always signifies innocence and purity. When we see red, this signifies the idea of, well, the, the reality of the passion of Christ eventually, that there will be suffering, out of self chosen suffering by the logos for the sins of humanity. But think of the dynamics of this painting. There's a lot of horizontality with this painting. Uh, nobody's standing up. Uh, Mary is laying down or perhaps sort of reclining uh, on the hay. Baby Jesus is doing the same on Mary. He's being supported by her arm over here. The holding of Mary's finger uh, by the baby Jesus also implies this sort of very relaxed state. There's nothing sort of really alert or, or looking at the world or sort of being aware of things. But there's this real feel of innocence uh, in this painting. If you think of the surroundings, the hay that you see that they are sort of laying on, and Mary also holding a bit of this, uh, there's a great sort of um, almost a, a, a paradox, if you will. She's literally playing with the creator of all that is in human form. There's this playfulness. There's this care. If we look at the face of Mary, she has these very heavily lidded eyes that are very, if you ever see a lot of Tintoretto, you'll, you'll notice it pretty soon. These very heavy lids, these dark um, lashes around the eyes. That's very typical of his work. Uh, that sets him apart from other artists. But you also see a little bit of rosy complexion on Mary's face. She's happy. She, she's she, she's a, in a state of, um, of happiness, of comfort, uh, giving to her child. You can see in the baby Jesus right here, there's a bit of a sort of glow. It's not that clear, but around his head, signifying, of course, that he is the Logos. You know, he, although he's in baby form at this point, uh, he is still uh, the word of God made flesh. When we look at the work of Tintoretto in showing his particular talent um, as an artist, the headdress on Mary, she also has a sort of a darker halo around her. But if we look right here at the headdress, it, it, it's almost see-through, which is almost like connoting some sort of like lace or some sort of transparent material. This, of course, takes great talent in art uh, by Tintoretto to portray. Um, it, later on, you will see uh, in Italian art, veiled sculpture, where you literally see a, pic a, a person's outline and covered with some sort of veil. This perhaps is an early, perhaps, uh, inspiration for that kind of uh, sculpture that'll come in the next couple of centuries. This actually also brings to mind to me that although Mary here is being seen or being portrayed, she does have a little bit of a halo above her head and she is holding the Christ child. 
she is being portrayed in very humble terms. This does not look like a crown for the queen of heaven. This much more looks like the garment of somebody who is not very well, well off, somebody who is um, rather more, more humble from more humble origins. Um, again, evoking this sense of Tintoretto that his particular empathy for, for, for people in the lower classes living during his time. Uh, he was living, by the way, Tintoretto was during the Counter-Reformation when the Roman Catholic Church was trying to reassert itself. Later on, you'll have Baroque art as, as literally an art form that will be a, a Counter-Reformation counter art form. But we see still this sense of being relaxed, very, very humble. The great draw, of course, if you look opposite where Mary and Jesus are, is right here, where we see what looks like a sun and a hill of sorts and some type of construction, um, perhaps some sort of building. It, it's, it's very small, but nevertheless, it, it does have sort of right angles. I've seen this painting over many years at the Legion of Honor. It is, it is one that I go back to um, more than once because it, it, it's, a, it, it's a very, how should I say, it, it is a very welcoming painting. Uh, Tintoretto, of course, is a greatly talented artist, but you don't really feel that he's very aloof. He's an, sort of an approachable, uh, artist and a painter in this sense, is supremely talented, but also trying to convey uh, some rather profound messages. When we look at this building over here, perhaps my little interpretation, this is the building evoking Jerusalem, where the Logos will one day be slated to go and perform his great act of selflessness. But note that it's still very far away. There is still great distance between Mary and the baby Jesus and his eventual um, sacrifice uh, for the sins of humanity um, on the cross. So we still focus here on the feeling of innocence, the feeling of being very at home, and, and more importantly, perhaps, or perhaps encapsulating both these two, th two things I said, of being with somebody, the mother and the child. One can't really approach the Christ child without approaching the mother first. This idea of being together it is very, very important for Chesterton to get across that Christianity is very much about communicating to other human beings that there was once in human history the supreme being, the Logos himself, who cared enough about other of his creations, cared enough to actually live with them, to be born in very humble circumstances, to, to live a very humble life of a carpenter and a teacher and eventually to, to perish at our, our own hands for our own sins. So this idea of Tintoretto trying to, or at least this, this visual of Tintoretto, communicating to us that innocence, family, togetherness, being with others. This is one of the great messages of Christianity that Chesterton is laying down. Now, if we perhaps dig a little bit deeper and see what Christianity is, uh, what, what is the opposite of this, uh, we will see something a little bit different. And this in the form of Tintoretto's teacher, Titian. This, what, this painting was probably suspended about 20, well, 15 or so feet above the ground at a very, um, a very beautiful gallery at the Minnesota Institute of Art, which by the way, I plug as well. If you're ever in the Minneapolis St. Paul area, it is a wonderful museum. Uh, where you will see um, some, some very interesting works of, of the old masters as well. This is a painting of Titian. I'll, I'll tell you the title in a, in a second, because it does kind of throw us a little bit of a curveball. Uh, that's how talented uh, Titian was. Um, but before we do that, and since I mentioned examining what was the opposite of what we just saw with Tintoretto, let me draw your attention to, um, from the text again to Chesterton on page 180. On page 180, a very interesting line from G.K. Chesterton. First full paragraph, about 60% or so down the page. Chesterton writes, unless we understand the presence of that enemy, we shall not only miss the point of Christianity, but even miss the point of Christmas. Chesterton stressing, unless we understand the presence of that enemy, now, what exactly is Chesson talking about? Now, Christianity distinguishes itself 
uh, and we even we can reflect on last week's presentation. It distinguishes itself by its recognition of evil. In its more overt manifestation that we see in the civilization of Carthage, which of course Rome pre-Judeo-Christian pre revelation was still able to say there's something wrong here with this idea of throwing away human life, of considering human life expendable. There is something that is not right, that should be resisted, that should be fought. But Chesed will also say Christianity is also very adept. It's also very well suited to recognizing more covert manifestations. Found, he says, uh, it, one of the inter more interesting lines he uses, insaner paganism. Uh, when we look at Carthage, that's perhaps a more insane paganism, where they did very overt evil. But there are other forms of the opposite of the innocence you saw in the first Tintoretto painting that perhaps are of note. Now, with regards to this, this painting was, uh, per was produced by Tintoretto between 1516 and 1525. I'm sorry, but by Titian, uh, please uh, forgive me for that. Um, it was, its backstory, which I'm getting to in, in a bit, is, is perhaps uh, where we get sort of the punchline, why, why this is very important. The title of this piece is The Temptation of Christ. Now, think, if you will, the temptation in the desert. Christ is there. He is not very, um, he has not eaten. He has not drank. He is approached, as you all know, uh, by the Lord of Lies himself which Tintoretto very cleverly paints as a young boy. The idea that evil does not approach you as a huge monster, oftentimes. It often approaches uh, with the guise of innocence, with the guise of being benign, of not being able to harm you, perhaps even of something that is good for you. But nevertheless, there is trickery involved. If we look at the actual painting, Jesus does have a halo, and Titian is very clever in having a halo, but also depicting somewhat of a cross with this point over here, one on the left, and one on the right, surrounding Christ. If we look at the mannerism of Jesus, he is not directly seeing or viewing who is supposed to be the devil in this picture. He is not necessarily making direct eye-to-eye -eye contact. This hand over here is right over his chest. Uh, this is normally, if you think of body language, a very sort of protective um, way of, it, this is your, the most vital por portion of your torso, yes? This is where you sort of protect. Uh, if you look at people who um, perform martial arts, who are boxers, they very much do the same thing. One hand is sort of guarding this axis here in the middle. I'm not saying that Jesus is doing the same thing, but, it, it, but it's the same sort of, um, it conveys a similar message. Uh, one of protecting what is, um, what is holy, what is virtuous, perhaps from something that is not. Oh, the question from this, uh, I believe these will be um, on YouTube uh, at some point. Uh, question from Julie, how should I search these talks online? Uh, it'll be by the C.S. Lewis Society, um, I, I think in the coming weeks or perhaps coming months. Hope that helps. Now, with regard to this painting, going back to it again, the hand over the chest is a protective gesture, but it's almost, even without Jesus saying it, you almost get this feeling that he's pulling himself back from something, almost communicating, I would not do a certain thing. I'm not going to open myself up to do this, um, to do, to do this request or do this action that you were asking me to do. So what, again, is the first temptation in the desert? Yes, he has not uh, had food for quite some time, hasn't drank, and he is approached by the devil, if you read scripture, uh, with a rock, with a stone, and says, you are the son of God, right? If you're the son of God, make this rock into bread. Eat it. You can do anything. You prove yourself that you indeed are the son of God. The, the, the reaction, of course, of Jesus, as we both know, as we all know, yes, is to say that man does not eat or, or nourish himself from bread alone, but also from the word of God. But interestingly enough, what is the guise of the devil in this sense? How, does, how is Titian presenting himself? Um, he is rather young, a boy's face. He has the look, and again, this is the particular skill of Titian. He has the look almost, um, if you're familiar with an old-fashioned adjective, sylvan, which means almost elf-like. There's almost something sprightly or woodsy about his appearance. You half expect to have pointy ears over here. Um, 
tussled hair, very youthful, nothing like you would imagine uh, a, a horrible uh, demon uh, being, or, or at least or, or the devil being. You also notice that the clothes he is wearing at first look humble. These are not uh, primary colors that he's wearing. Uh, Christ, of course, has the blue and the red uh, in this case. More earth tones, which gives us the idea this is not someone of royal birth. This is not someone who is trying to communicate that he has um, that he is taking pleasure from the uh, uh, the riches of, of, of the world. But if we look at the sh- small detail, at the sleeve under the tunic, it looks like rolled up, if you will, lace or, or some sort of finer material uh, under the actual tunic. Now, this could be some sort of undershirt under the tunic, but it gives us any, but it gives us a little bit of a picture of vanity that this devil in this form still can't escape having some sort of sign, some sort of tell that he values his pride, his vanity, that he is different from others. Note, if you will, what was the temptation to Christ, yes? If you are God, you call yourself the son of God, turn this into bread. Show that you are special. Show that you are apart. Now contrast this with Tintoretto where you have Mary and the baby Jesus together. This is pride. This Lewis says, of course, yes, if we read Mere Christianity by Lewis, Lewis says that pride is the worst of all sins because it makes all the other sins or vices worse than they are. Pride is inherently competitive. It strives always to have more than somebody else, to set oneself apart from somebody else. Or if we can't be more than somebody else, to make that somebody else less than we are. But here, the direct request is, look, prove you are a part. Prove you are God. Prove you do not have to suffer with the people. But what is the response of Jesus? No, I'm not going to eat. I'm not, I'm not going to make the stone into bread. If I'm going to be hungry, I will, I will be hungry. I will share this humanity with people. I will share this humanity with others. So this, in a way, is a lesson to avoid pride, which would be the enemy to what you saw in the earlier Ditoretto painting, the idea of togetherness, the spirit of humanity to be with God and to be with each other. Now, I mentioned the backstory earlier and and why that's sort of the crux uh, of this painting, what makes this painting so much more interesting. Um, uh, Not to say that Titian isn't interesting in his own right. If I could give a plug to Titian, why I'm particularly fond of him as a painter, I first saw him uh, as a high school school graduate in 1989. Uh, my parents took me to, uh, to Europe. We went to the Vatican Museum, and I first heard this word Titian. I, I was wondering what that was. And when I saw the Titian painting, I said, okay, this seems rather special. Uh, and in the years later, I've come to have an appreciation of the greatness of this particular painter. Titian is a painter, when you look at his work, it, it, it captures your eye. His painting captures your eye because there is almost nothing close to almost nothing, that is necessary in the painting. When Titian paints, he can convey something like the Venus of or- or- or Urbino at the Uffizi Museum, which is very racy and very carnal. But he can also paint the Virgin Mary ascending into heaven at the Frari Church in Venice, the Assunta or the Assumption of the Virgin into heaven, where you, where you can see this painter capturing what, what, what heavenly grace is. It's, it's really a truly amazing sight. With Titian, I, I've always gotten the, the, the feeling, and it truly is a feeling, that it's so complete that there's nothing lacking in Titian. There's nothing sort of you could do to make it better. It's all there. And if you just take the time to look at it again and again, you'll sort of see the refinement, the passion in his painting um, as a whole package. So what makes the backstory and how does the backstory add to this and also add to what Chesterton is saying? The backstory, of course, of this painting is that it was brought to Minneapolis in 1925. At that time, almost 100 years ago, uh, it was one of less than a dozen Titians in the United States. It was very rare. It was a very big deal for the city of Minneapolis to have a work by the Venetian giant. There was great celebration, and the Minnesota Institute of Art, the MIA, as it's called by people who live in Minneapolis, Will, will, at the time, were very proud 
because they felt, and again, I use proud cautiously, but they were, they were very proud in that they finally had something that put them on the map, so to speak, in terms of possessing the greats of art. They, it was a sign for them and a sign for them communicating to the outside world that this is what they aspired to, to be a, a world-class museum, uh, to not just, you don't have to go to Washington, D.C. or Boston or New York. You can come to the Midwest and see this great piece of art. But here's the thing. Before it got to Minneapolis, it was exhibited in New York City. So shortly before the, it, it was bought and, and brought over to the Midwest, it, it stayed in New York for a little bit. Um, and during its stay in New York, there was talk of it in, you've probably, uh, the magazine, The New Yorker, um, there was a, uh, there, there's sort of a column in The New Yorker called Talk of the Town, uh, which is um, a, a section of that magazine that is devoted to aesthetics, to the goings on of art around New York at that time. Uh, but you have to think about sort of the background of The New Yorker uh, when it was founded, if I'm not mistaken, its founding editor. Um, made the comment that the readership they were shooting for was very different. It was not a generalist or a, for a, sort of a general uh, publication. In the words, I believe, of the founding editor of The New Yorker, um, it's demographic, it, which I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but we are not shooting for the old lady in Dubuque. We are shooting for a much more metropolitan, cosmopolitan readership. So with that in mind, in the talk of the town section of The New Yorker, there was a short blurb on this painting, and I quote, Going around early, we find art in her shift and sometimes before she has had her morning coffee. Thus, we came upon Titian before the palms and ferns were set. Only the spotlight had been adjusted and the elegant plush curtains. The formula for the sophisticate is easy to follow. But we plead to seriousness and deny any spitball in the eye of reverence. We merely do not cringe before Titian. The New Yorker saying, yeah, we've seen this before. We've got Titians here. We've probably seen a Michelangelo or two, maybe some Da Vinci. So no disrespect to the people who would venerate this. Wink, wink, hint, hint, the people in the Midwest who so venerate this new painting they have now. But we've seen and done this before. We are much more well-read. Uh, we are much more um, lettered than other folks around the country. And therefore, we don't have any great, uh, we're not going to uh, you know, sort of uh, lower ourselves uh, to this work of art. It's an interesting blurb. And what it communicated to me in a very strange way was that the author of this piece was succumbing to what was being warned against in this painting. The author of this piece was setting himself and perhaps his readership apart from the other people around the country who would so treasure a Titian, who would say, finally, we have something special to, to feel good about ourselves in our community. The author of this piece is saying, ah, you know, that's for you guys to feel good about, but we, we've seen and done this before. The author of this piece, hence the backstory of this painting, is falling into pride, is falling into exactly what this painting is saying not to do. A warning against setting yourself apart. A warning against saying that you want to compete or you're competitive, competitively placing yourself, i.e. Lewis, above others, superior to others, more cultured than others. Hence, we don't pay too much attention to this painting, uh, to this Titian painting. Um, before I get any further with our last work that does, um, that does tie into this quite well, uh, I'd like to ask just a basic question uh, to anybody. Of course, feel free to, um, you know, uh, on the mic or on, on, the, on chat. Uh, what does it mean to be cultured? It is a point of pride that is being unstated by the author of this piece in The New Yorker. But it is something that is not necessarily being used, if you remember from last week, yes, when I showed you guys the Joshua Reynolds painting, that is not being used to elevate. More so, it is being used to elevate the self instead of others. 
But is it possible to be cultured and not be prideful? When can we perhaps say that someone uh, has achieved the state of being cultured? David, are you going to speak? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll give it my best, my best try. Sure. Uh, I, I'd say it, someone is cultured when they're able to understand parallel um, environments or places uh, or experiences that aren't their own and mm -hmm. be able to have some em empathy for those who are experiencing um, situations either across the country or elsewhere in the world. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I'm sorry, my mistake. Oh, let me get back to this. Okay. So, is, uh, were you saying then that, um, that being cultured is being empathetic? Uh, I, yeah, I, I think that's part of it. I, I suppose I hadn't thought really through too, too okay. much until now, but okay. uh, I think that's part of it. How, how exactly would it be empathetic? Because uh, if one is cultured, one could find oneself in a situation where person B is not. So how would empathy play into here? It's a good question. <laughs> I have to think about that. That's why I'm here and I'm here twice on Sunday. Uh, anyway, that being said. Uh, something from, from the chats I've seen, uh, we have been taught that knowledge is power. Certainly, uh, that, that, is, um, it, that, that is a, a well-known, uh, perhaps, maxim. Is this the same thing as being cultured? To be knowledgeable. I don't think being knowledgeable and, and being cultured are the same. Okay. I mean, when the word cultured infer or imply, sorry, um, being in tune with one's culture, being yes. enmeshed in one's culture. Right. How would one act if one was culture, cultured, if one is enmeshed in one's own culture? Well, ideally you'd be would have embraced the values of your culture and be expressing the values of your culture in mm -hmm. everything you do. Okay, very good. Uh, second comment, again, from Mary, uh, let's see, uh, Mary Langer. Uh, not really, because you can always encounter another culture you know nothing about. Uh, very true. So then how does one, how can we say as the author of this uh, blurb uh, uh, referring to the Tishan piece, Without really saying it, the author is establishing himself at that time, or perhaps herself, as having this immeasurable quality, something that somebody else from another part of the country does not have. How can we see it? Where, where, where do we measure it if we do have it? Cheshire is, is warning us, yes, that the act of doing this of establishing a, uh, that we have a superior that we are that we are superior because we're cultured puts distance between us and other people oh, interesting point a question for, uh, for or comment from robert i feel like having culture knowledge cultural knowledge or having cross-cultural awareness that's empathetic but the way i have normally heard the way culture being used i think people are saying i get all this i, I get all of this stuff that is so important but the rest of you just don't get it very good <laughs> That perhaps is a possibility, but but what is so important about the stuff? That the, the person who is cultured uh, somehow possesses that the rest of us rubes perhaps don't. What is so important about it? Well, I think the usual use of cultured is you know exceptional appreciation of art opera. Mm -hmm ballet whatever yes um, and so which used to be <laughs> you know performing arts for the masses mm -hmm. and were appreciated as form were accessible to the masses even in my mother's time mm -hmm. and were consumed by the masses before uh you know we got hoity torty about it uh -huh. um, but again i think it comes down to if it's appreciation for our cultural values, then anyone ought to be able to 
uh, embody those and express those, no matter how simple a person they are. Very good. Um, I often tell students from where I teach at the Academy of Art University in San Francisco that when they go to, um, these are art students, of course, it's an art university, that when, it, when, they go, when they go to Europe, to Italy, especially, and go to Florence or Rome or Venice, and when they see the art that is there in situ, you know, on site, uh, in churches, uh, in museums, specifically in churches, to look at the art and, yes, appreciate the skill that went into producing this art. Many, uh, the people who made these knew that they would not live to see these completed. We saw the Milan Duomo last week as an example. But aside from looking at the skill that made something and being appreciative of this, which, of course, means that one is somewhat cultured, one should also look at the reverence and, and the emotion and the holding something sacred that many of these craftsmen poured their, themselves into to leave us something to wonder at. Now, here is culture being used not to separate, not to pit people apart, but rather to bring people together. To say, I am going to do something, I'm going to produce something that is that has aesthetic value that is lasting. Perhaps that is even beautiful, if we can approach that great ideal. But because it approaches this great ideal of beauty, it can be shared not just by me. It's not just good by my standards. It can be shared by others who will find it beautiful, beautiful uh, and filled with reverence as well. So something that can also bring people together, not just pit them apart. Now, here's what Chesterton says um, that is perhaps a little bit more troublesome that ties into this idea of pride and why it is so divisive as the opposite of the innocence we see in Tintoretto. Innocence is actually mentioned by Chesterton here uh, on page 180. I'm sorry, 179 from the text. Chesterton, of course, is mentioning, is talking about uh, this, this source of evil that sometimes we, we don't recognize because like the young boy in the Titian painting, evil does not present itself as horrible or morbid or, or ghastly. It, it sometimes can present itself as, as an innocent thing. If we go to the bottom of that page, 179, Chesterton is talking about this form of evil, if you will. Last sentence, in the description of that demon worship found before in places like Carthage, of course, of the devouring detestation of innocence shown in the works of its witchcraft, and the most inhuman of its human sacrifice, I have said less of its indirect and secret penetration of the saner paganism. If we pause there, back to 179, the phrase that really caught my attention while reading this book to prepare for, uh, to present to you was det the detestation of innocence, the hating of the innocent, the hating of the good. Frankly, this was something that I spent a, a a good amount of time trying to figure out what exactly was it that made human beings at times, if we go back to the Carthaginian civilization last week, and its, see, and, and its lowering of the value of human life to sacrifice its most innocent, to, to false gods, if you will. What was it? What, what would motivate that? Now, if I could show you another painting that perhaps will give us a little bit of, a, of context here. These past uh, works were found in the United States, of course, uh, San Francisco and Minneapolis. Let me take you, take you to Florence. This fresco is found at the Santa Maria del Carmine Church. It is one of the not so famous churches in Florence. You have to cross the bridge. There, there's more than one, but you have to cross the bridge into the um, other section of Florence. It's called Oltrarno the other section of the Arno, the other side of the Arno River. Um, in the neighborhood of Drago, there is this church called the Santa Maria del Carmine. It is most famous, of course, for housing the Brancacci Chapel, where this particular um, fresco is found. The Brancacci Chapel is famous because of an artist called Masaccio. But Masaccio did not, was not by himself in, in um, painting these works at the chapel. There was another artist, uh, also from that region called Massolino, who is often talked of in terms of being together with Masaccio. That was the, the, the duo, if you will, who worked at this Brancacci chapel at the Santa Maria del Carmine. Massolino 
um, painted this around 1425, so rather early in the Renaissance. He was a student, just on the side of the um, famous sculptor Lorenzo Ghiberti. If you ever go to Florence on the uh, more, more popular side of the Arno River, by the Duomo, you will see the baptistery, uh, the, the old place where people used to get baptized. Dante was baptized there. There are these huge bronze gilt doors uh, of the baptistery. Those are called by Michelangelo the Gates of Paradise. Ghiberti was a sculptor who worked for 27 years of building those gates. One of his students at his workshop was Masolino, who again um, worked with Masaccio at the um, Carmine Church. If we look at this painting, this is called The Temptation of Adam and Eve. It seems pretty straightforward when we look at it. It doesn't have the great mannerist, um, how should I say, um, expression with limbs sort of, you know, and bodies in very strange positions. There's a lot of verticality here uh, in, in this painting. We see very uniquely that there is almost, there's no floor in this painting. There's no like ground that Adam and Eve are like standing on. If we even look at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, there's, it, it seems like it's just kind of like hanging, sort of like standing there with no real roots, um, you know, attached to the ground. I, I read this a little bit too, perhaps this is Masolino trying to tell us that the knowledge of good and evil is not terrestrial. It's not earthly. It's not something that you get from studying atoms or, or carbon. It, it's something metaphysical, you know, otherworldly uh, in that sense. So we see here, of course, Adam and Eve. Uh, this is something I picked up, to be honest, just today when I was reviewing this to present uh, to you all. The location of Eve's arm around the tree. Now, whether it's Adam and Eve, right? This is not a human being just touching the tree or just kind of like hanging on it, like with one hand on it. Uh, this is Eve with her arm literally around the tree. Now, why the significance of this? Masolini perhaps trying to convey to us that human beings have this com compelling need to want to possess things, to want to sort of claim ownership of something. And in this particular case, it's the knowledge of good and evil of the tree. Now, note, if you will, we see Adam and Eve this, uh, right here. Note the serpent as it snakes its way around the tree. And note, if you will, how the head of the serpent is being portrayed. Again, no fire-breathing dragon. No great horrible monster. Rather something that looks almost cherub-like, that looks almost angelic. The fair hair, the face that does not look like it's in anger, that does not look like it's in a great moment of uh, deviousness or, or, or hatred to humanity, but rather it's just looking on. It's just looking on to say, okay, what are these people going to do now? I've sort of set the stage. It's their call, what they do at this moment, if they, if they eat from the tree or not. Masolino trying to communicate in this painting, again, that evil does not come, as we saw from Titian earlier. It, it does not come breathing fire or, or very aggressive. It sometimes comes under the guise of innocence. But that leaves us a question. What about evil? What about malice? What about badness? Makes it want to destroy innocence. Why is there a detestation of innocence? Why, why is there this, and, and again, I, I caution folks who look too much into this, there is a great line from uh, Professor Tolkien, if you read his Lord of the Rings um, uh, story. Tolkien will be very upfront and say, uh, when he cites, when he, when he writes about the formerly good wizard Saruman, Saruman the White, who becomes Saruman of many colors. He will say of Saruman that Saruman studied evil too much tried to understand it too much. This is Tolkien reminding us that it's good to sort of know how evil is there and how to avoid it, but we should not really overly indulge ourselves in looking too much into it. Because before we know it, we're up to our eyeballs in it. And it's very hard to get out of that morass. So what about this Lord of Lies would want to, would hate innocence so much to destroy it? To this, I'm gonna bring up something from Milton uh, in Milton's Paradise Lost. I was actually wondering about this the other day before I, I, I was finishing off my prep time uh, for this talk. 
And I, I happened to call one of my good friends, uh, it was a professor of English literature, uh, Richard Sonnenschein, who used to teach with me at Campion College here in San Francisco. And I asked him this question, and he brought to mind to me that in Milton's Paradise Lost, when Lucifer sins, yes, and goes down to hell and becomes Satan, and he says that very famous line, which is, you know, it's better to rule in hell than to serve in heaven. I will not serve. Serving is anathema to him. He would rather be the Lord. He would rather be the boss, if you will. But he also realizes that God is the source of all that is good. So if he's going to be different, if he's going to find any sort of meaning in what he's doing, his pride has taken him apart. Think of the, the last painting as well. Has taken him apart from God. There is no communion anymore. There is no more fellowship. Pride says, I want to be set apart and I'm special because I'm different. You know, I don't want to follow. Then the devil has to come up with a reverse system of ethics, which basically says, if what God does and says is good, then I'm going to do the reverse. My good will be evil. My good will be sin. And if God is about togetherness, if God is about love, if God is about communion of people with each other and with God, then I will strive to separate. Pride is as a means to create distance from the most divine, from the source of all good. Hence, now evil is his good. Note that Satan says, doesn't say that, that good does not exist. He's not saying that. He's saying, I acknowledge it's there. But I also say that I am choosing to be something more than what I am. Just checking in from the chat. Okay. Oops, sorry. What does one think of this idea of separating oneself? Isn't some of that good to separate ourselves, to be proud of ourselves, to uh, acknowledge that we are particularly skilled at something, that we are, have been gifted with an affinity, with a certain talent for something that is not the same as other people, that we have a different quality than other people? Isn't some of that uh, not a bad thing? Should, do we do, do we, um, are we doing too much warding off this idea of pride? Isn't there a good pride to have? Or does all of it suddenly have to be horrible and bad? Any thoughts on this? Well, while we make way for others to respond, I would just say, yes, we're supposed to recognize our talents and utilize them appropriately. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's different from pride. It's it's recognizing what God has given us that differentiates from others and then discerning how we can apply those to advance his will here on earth. On earth. So being appreciative of what we have been given, thankful perhaps as well, and being cognizant of how that can allow us to, to, to spread... To bless others and to, right. again, advance um, God's wisdom, insights, truths. And that can be in any number of ways. It can be in just our day-to-day -day recognizing that if we go through our lives mm -hmm. exercising the golden rule with everyone with whom we come in contact, yes, uh, giving them love and appreciation, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a huge expression of of God's grace. Agreed. Uh, question from Veronica, you have your hand up. So um, the question is, what, what would you be, what would you have to be proud of? Okay. And I'll follow that with the question, what do you have that you have not been given? Right? That's mm -hmm. uh, the scripture. I, I don't have the scripture reference on that, but what, what do you have to be proud of? What have you done completely of your own self of your mm -hmm. own being right we've been given life breath means you know uh, if you're good looking god made you good looking right <laughs> <laughs> right how how can you be proud of that we're we're meant to be as mary was pointing out stewards yes 
we're stewards. Mm -hmm. So we boast, we boast in the Lord, Mm -hmm. right? And not in ourselves uh, because we are, we've only received, uh, we haven't been, uh, you know, we haven't created things ourselves. Yes. No, we haven't. But at the same time, we're not just to be passive receivers of of blessings, but we're to utilize the talents that God gave Faithful us. Faithful stewards. And to, and to uh, advance, you apply them in our own realms. So it's not, yes, it's faithful stewards, but it's, it's beyond faithful stewardship. It's also faithful users and entrepreneurs mm-hmm. with the raw materials we were given and to use our the minds that God gave us to be sub-creators, as, as yes. uh, Dorothy Sayers told us, is God created us to be sub-creators. He gave us talents with which to sub-create, but it is up to us to take those and bring them to fruition and take them into the world Mm -hmm. and not merely, you know, wait for the manifestation of, of our gifts. Very good. That's something from the chat from Mary um, Langer, blessed to be a blessing. So we we are fortunate and blessed to be a blessing to others. Really good point on that. But what what would happen if um, just a, just a, this question off the top of my head, what would happen if we realized that we uh, were blessed to be given certain talents that would benefit other people? And then we find somebody else who has similar talents than we have to also be a blessing to other people. Uh, might something creep in, perhaps it's human nature, that would say, I'm better at being good than this other person? Of course it's human nature. <laughs> would, that be, would, would that be a bad thing? The scripture says, who are you to judge another man's servant? Right. 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 So, so I think, we, Mary, what you're what I hear from what you're saying, Mary, is uh the you don't bury your your gifts, right? You you make profit out of it. Mm-hmm. That's the talents, right? Yes, you profit others by your talents, and uh that's what we're called to do. Mm. And if you see others and you're you start the feeling of jealousy starts to creep in that oh my gosh they're doing good you know am i doing good better you know that is the snake talking to us always (laughs) and it's always the snake's always going to tell us whisper in our ears for that right so it's our job as uh beings to stamp that down it's Mm. natural it's going to happen and you have to just you just have to step on the head of that darn snake. <laughs> Very good. Uh, from the comments from Robert, each part of the body has our own function, and we know that we are able to do and are good at, so we can do our part serving confidently. My function is different than your function, but there is no superiority of or inferiority. Uh, knowing and using my gift is not pride. I hope we find another brother or sister of the same talent so we can really get excited about working together. Agreed. Uh, very much so. Uh, I do have one question, considering what you just said. If we maintain that there is no superiority or inferiority, and we meet somebody else who says there is superiority or inferiority, by saying that we are right and they are wrong, will we not be ourselves saying we are superior to them? <laughs> oh, Jose. <laughs> um, That's the question. I don't think you tell them you're wrong, right? You... Um... I think you have to agree that we're, or try to, if you choose to engage with them at all, Mm -hmm. just express that we're serving wonderful functions. We're all, we're each serving wonderful functions. And uh, the great thing is that there are so many needs in the world that we can both meet those needs for the disparate Mm -hmm. communities that are there. Very good. Agreed. Thanks. Uh, Just wanted to touch base right now. We're going to take a short break and come back for a second portion. I have two more pieces of art to show you. Uh, Let me just stop screen sharing. Great. So let's just uh, take a little break, stretch our legs a little bit, and we'll get back and and, and continue our chess system. Thank you. So following from where we um, ended off with that painting from Mussolino, um, just try to capture something 
from Chesterton before we um, I, I read you a quote, just me trying to put things uh, in some sort of order to make better sense of it. Pride, as can be seen from the previous painting, what we just saw from Masolino, is debilitating in a certain sense. Of course, it leads to a fall that comes right after um, eating from the tree, uh, tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It tells us that the perceived advancement of human history, that the world somehow can save itself. This is something that Chesterton is warning us about. The idea that somehow we can self pro provide ourselves salvation simply by ourselves. Human ingenuity contributes to this. It leads to this. This is an alternate way of looking at something called Stoicism. Stoicism, of course, is a Greco-Roman pagan philosophy uh, that says that we are able to, given enough discipline, enough toughness, enough strength of character, we can withstand all the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Unfortunately, there's a downside to this. Stoicism and believing ourselves to be strong because we, we can withstand the world, we can withstand temptation, itself can lead to pride. Uh, one of my mentors is Father James Schull. He's now gone. He uh, used to teach at Georgetown University. He was a government professor there for many years. Before that, he taught at USF in San Francisco and also at the Pontifical Gregorian Univers University in Rome, uh, also known as the Greg in Rome. Uh, Jim Schull used to always say that um, to be very careful of Stoicism, of Stoic philosophy, simply because Stoicism is the gateway to pride. It leads to pride. How so? Well, if we are really, really strong and we, we can withstand all of the rigors of the world, we can say to ourselves, look at me, I did it alone. I did it by myself. I don't need anything else. Stoicism as a philosophy, it says we can save ourselves, so to speak, from the travails of the world. What both share, pride and stoicism, is the denial of the need for grace of something else, of the gift of grace, the gift that saves. And pride, Stoicism is another way of getting there, leads to dissipation and exhaustion. Exhaustion is something that frankly, since the enlightenment, people have thought doesn't really happen. Progress is always moving forward. Progress is always good moving forward. In fact, that was, um, that was Chesterton's challenge to H.G. Wells. That Wells's writing is basically saying that as we progress further into human history, as we are more and more advanced than we were, we are better, and we don't really we don't really slide back. We keep on getting better and moving forward. But there are certain points of history where we see this dissipation. Uh, I'd encourage you to uh, just on the side, if you have any free time, uh, the British art historian Sir Kenneth Clark in the 60s and 70s had a brilliant. Uh, series called Civilization, uh, with an S actually, because he's British. Uh, Kenneth Clark basically does a, a, a video tour of art, kind of similar to what I do. Of course, I'm not Kenneth Clark. Uh, I try to uh, approach you know, his level of erudition. But he also will analyze civilizations uh, that house the schools of art that he's mentioning. And he will discuss places like Rome and Greece, of course, and he will say, what brings these civilizations eventually down? Why Rome would eventually, you know, uh, Rome as an empire would eventually cease is because if, as a civilization, it was exhausted. It was too tired. It couldn't support itself anymore. If you put Kenneth Clark together with Christopher Dawson, a historian I've done more than a few presentations on for the C.S. Lewis Society, Dawson will say that civilization needs something to give it life, needs something to animate it, to, to, to sort of give it rejuvenation every now, and, every now and then. And that usually comes in the form of religion, of some sort of binding glue that holds people together. Religion, of course, from the Latin verb religare, to keep something together, to tie something together. Without that, things generally sort of dissipate and fall apart. Again, something that modern thinking, modern philosophy has a hard time grasping, that modernity can somehow lead to essentially the end of the road, where there's no going back and you have to start anew. So pride has a tendency of leading to this sort of dissipation uh, and separation and exhaustion, not only in civilizations, but in human beings as well. An example of this, and allow me to share this with you. 
this is a painting found here in California. We're here back in the US. Uh, this is found at the mission in Sonoma. If, if one travels up to wine country, if you have any for, uh, spare time, uh, there's a, a beautiful plaza in the city of Sonoma or town of Sonoma. Uh, there's a lot of wine tasting there. You can have a really good time. But do take some time to visit the old mission that was built um, about 1823. So it's been there for almost 200 years. It was the last of the missions built with the initiative of Spain, beginning in the late 1700s, uh, all up and down what used to be called Alta California, which of course was you know, San Diego on up. So the Sonoma mission was the last of these. Uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, it wasn't Spain anymore that built the Sonoma mission. It was, it was Mexico. It was a new country now that built this mission. Uh, this was found in the church of the mission in Sonoma. And when my wife and I were there visiting uh, this last spring, uh, this painting, of course, it's one of the Stations of the Cross, uh, really caught my attention for a couple of reasons. And I thought this, it couldn't be more suited to what we're discussing now with Chesterton, uh, the, the idea of, um, of trying to avoid some sort of dissipation. So allow me to um, find for you on page 209 from Chesterton, something to give this context, of course. Uh, on page 209 from Chesterton, this is the first full paragraph beginning with, it is more within my powers. If you scroll down from there, very last sentence, all the great groups that stood about the cross represent in one way or another the great historical truth of the time that the world could not save itself. Man could do no more. Rome and Jerusalem and Athens and everything else were going down like a sea turned into a slow cataract. Externally, indeed, the ancient world was still at its strongest. It is always at the moment that the, it is always at that moment that the inmost weakness begins. But in order to understand that weakness, we must repeat what has been said more than once, that it was not the weakness of a thing originally weak. It was emphatically the strength of the world that was turned to weakness and the wisdom of the world that was turned to folly. If you remember from last week, I showed you Rubens's painting, The Massacre of the Innocents. In that painting, Rome, of course, yes, who triumphed over Carthage, who saved the world, if we can think of it that way, from the chilling uh, legacy of the Carthaginians, itself now becomes complacent as an empire, no longer a republic. It now has Herod, who is um, a king working under the Roman Empire, but Herod, of course, is very jealous, very afraid of this new uh, king of the Jews. And he goes out and, set, and sets about to create this great atrocity. So Rome, in, in the course of the, in the uh, Rubens painting from last time, yes, Rome and the king of the Jews being Herod put together, uh, somehow are able to, to, to produce something that is as horrific as anything the Carthaginians were doing before that. So we see, in a way, these two great civilizations, these two great legacies of the pagan world. I'm sorry, not the pagan world only, but also the Judeo-Christian world. But they, they somehow hit an end point, and something else is needed. So what do we see in this painting? We see dissipation in this painting. We see sort of a lowering of a standard, a lowering of a civilization. If you look right down here, lower left-hand corner, we see Roman soldiers gambling with dice for the clothes of Christ. Why is this notable? These Roman soldiers once saved the known world, once saved the known world from the uh, Baal-worshipping Carthaginians, who, who, who perhaps would have spread this religion to other parts of the world. But here, they are lowered. Uh, they are now engaging in a game of chance for someone who they don't even believe to be God. Instead of being these great brave warriors, they are reduced to gambling. Uh, they are filled with ennui, with boredom, and, and not even paying attention to the human suffering we're seeing uh, at Golgotha. But we see, uniquely enough, a refusal to participate in dissipation. And where do we see this? We see this in Christ himself. We see this person right here on the, uh, this left, uh, towards the left of your painting, uh, of the painting, his foot is by what looks like some sort of pot or jar, and he is extending something for Christ to Christ. 
Now, of course, as we know, Jesus turns down the wine once and does drink from the vinegar a little bit later on. A little bit of research on this was kind of interesting to find out. The, the initial offering was a wine that was usually offered to, um, to make people who were on the cross to make their passing from this world a little bit easier. That, that wine, uniquely enough, was laced with myrrh. Now, why is this interesting? Myrrh, of course, was one of the gifts of the Magi uh, to Christ in Bethlehem. But that was turned down by Jesus. He then accepts something a little bit later on, the, the latter offering, which was closer or more akin to vinegar. Uh, this, I believe, was also called posca. It, it was sort of a drink that rejuvenated somebody who was very thirsty. It, it didn't dull your senses like the previous wine that was offered that, would, that was almost like an anesthetic that would almost make you dull to the pain you're experiencing. But rather, it would make you, it would bring you back out from your, from your being very, very thirsty, uh, from dehydration. So where do we see in this, in Jesus denying the drink once and then accepting it the second time, where do we see this refusing to participate in dissipation? We see it in him basically saying, I don't want the drink that will make me take leave of my senses, not feel what I'm feeling, not be with people who are also suffering. I am here in this human condition. People go through pain. There are two thieves right next to me. They're going through pain too. So I'm not exactly going to not suffer what they're suffering. Think of the Titian painting and having the temptation to turn the stone into bread. It's a similar sort of vein. In this case, I am not going to dull my pain I'm rather going to suffer with people. I will slake my thirst, yes, but I will not make myself numb to what, I, what, what I'm able to feel at this moment. Just a side note on this painting as, far, as a technical painting. Uh, the mission was built in 1823, but this painting in which, I'm sorry, this church in which this painting is found is a survivor. By the way, this painting has an anonymous artist. We don't know who painted this. Presumably one of the early indigenous people uh, whom the friars came and spread Christianity to. We see, of course, learning from the tradition going all the way back a thousand years ago with the blue and the red uh, being used in this painting as well to give it color. Now, as a survivor, as I, as I mentioned this, the church that this painting was in was eventually secularized around 1834. So it was only in operation as a mission for about 11 years, from 1823 to 1834. It then fell into disrepair before a, a, a concerned group of people in the region. It, it, by the way, eventually turns into a warehouse of all things, uh, the, the church in 1881, uh, until a preservation society um, rebuilt the church and brought these old paintings that were initially there um, in the 11 year span between 1823 and 1834 back into a reconstructed church. He, of course, here in the painting, and what really struck my attention when we saw this, um, my wife and I were there you know, some months ago, what really struck, uh, caught my attention was the two thieves. Uh, tradition holds, of course, yes, that the thief on the right, I'm sorry, the left, uh, the bad thief, uh, is named Gestas, and the thief on Christ's right, the good thief, uh, is called Dismas. Now, what is unique about them, and, and why did this catch my attention? Uh, Gestas, the unrepentant thief, yes, the bad thief, what you will, tells Christ, look, if you're the son of God, why not free yourself and free us? It was a goading, a, a goading of Christ, perhaps based on pride, something very similar to what you saw in the Titian painting. Hey, prove it. If you're the son of God, why don't you save us too? But the good thief rebukes Gestas. Dismas says, look, you and I are suffering with justice because we've done bad things. We've stolen, we've committed crimes, and we deserve our punishment. But this man here in the middle is innocent. He doesn't deserve this punishment. He then says to Jesus, as we know, um, you know, please remember me. You know, I'm here with you. I know I'm not innocent, but, but I'm willing to, to believe in you right now. To which Christ responds with truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. The emphasis, again, is being with, is being together, not being apart. 
Now, if you look at the way the artist, the unnamed artist, painted this painting, we see particular, I'll use the word brilliance because I thought it was quite brilliant. If we look at how Gestas, the unrepentant thief, is portrayed physically, note, if you will, the shoulders raised up. Discomfort, tension, something you don't do when you're relaxed, something you don't do when you're at home with other people, almost a protective gesture, raising up these shoulders to protect your head. In, in a sense. We see also, aside from that tension in the shoulders of the, unrepent, of the, of the uh, unrepentant thief, we see also the face of Gestas. Note how he tries very hard to turn away. He's not even bothering to look at the cross in the middle. He's saying, no, I want no part of it. I want no participation in this. I don't want to be with this at all. The way the face is painted there is almost, especially when one looks at the eyes, there is an almost skull-like quality to this. There is still flesh around the head of the unrepentant uh, thief, but we see almost, uh, almost an image of a, a coming death, if you will, uh, with, with this almost skull-like appearance. This brings to mind to me, of course, if you're familiar with Professor Tolkien, the way he describes the nine kings of men who were corrupted by the Dark Lord uh, and chased after the ring. They were the ring raids. They were once proud warrior kings, but they have been re reduced to being ghosts. If you look at them, if you have the ring like Frodo does, again, if you read the books or watch the movies, if you have the ring, you can see these kings as they truly are. They're invisible to eyes otherwise, but they're completely dissipated. They're basically like, they're still powerful. They can still harm you. But, but they are basically shadows of what they used to be. It's almost as if it brings to mind something I mentioned at the end of, of uh, last week's meeting, uh, that line from Mere Christianity, I'm sorry, no, from um, the screw tape letters, where the older demon is telling the younger demon the true trick of sin is to tell people that if they simply do something, this thing called sin, they will get everything when in the end they get nothing. It is this choice in sin to choose nothingness instead of choosing being, instead of choosing togetherness. It is the choice to be apart, to be permanently apart in that sense. And we see this in the way that Gestas the Thief is painted by this um, particularly brilliant artist, uh, unknown artist at the, um, uh, the Sonoma Mission. Now, that being said, note, if you will, how Dismas, the repentant thief, uh, is depicted. If we, look at thing, if we look at him, he has a face that is almost youthful. And then, now note he's being nailed on the cross. It's not a pleasant experience. But he, an almost youthful, almost joyous face looking directly at Christ. If you didn't have a cross in the background, if you look at how the legs are positioned, again, if you didn't have a cross in the background, you'd have movement, almost like a running movement. And look at the arms. Almost arms that are coming to embrace Christ. Something that is not saying, I don't want any part of this, but something that is saying, someone who is saying, I, I want to be part of this. I, I still long togetherness. I want to be with the logos. I want to share communality with other people uh, in heaven. Uh, and at least at this dying moment, I'm not letting pride get in my way. I'm not letting this dissipation we see with the Roman soldiers, with Gestus, the, the unrepentant thief, get in my way of being with he who is literally love in that sense. This was a, pardon me, particularly profound uh, painting, I believe, and uh, a sign that um, if somebody does grasp the teachings of this faith that Chesterton is talking about, uh, there, there's, there's so much profundity here. There, there, there's so much to digest that is happening uh, in this painting. Now, for our last piece for today, I bring you back to the Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota Institute of Art and this Madonna and Child. This Madonna and Child is stone, uh, I believe, limestone. Uh, it was polychrome, which means it was once painted. 
Uh, it, it, it wasn't originally uh, just a gray stone that you're seeing in front of you, but rather it did have a coloration and paint around it. Uh, being a work of the 14th century, the 1300s, there was a style of art at that time in sculpture wherein you would have these Madonna and child statues. And there would be, if you, know, if you look a little bit closely, there would be the semblance of a letter S snaking around this way, accentuating the hips that are holding. If you guys had have kids or been around kids, nieces and nephews, or your kids yourself or your grandkids, I'm blessed with both. Um, when you get a little tired, you're not just standing up straight. You're kind of using your hip a little bit to help you out, you know, ca carry that weight. Uh, this particular device, this particular style of art, again, the S curve right here, is um, particularly uh, apropos from this point, uh, th this moment in history, the 14, uh, 14th century or 1300s. Very different from what happened years before, centuries before, where you had much more verticality, sort of straight lines uh, in that sense. It shows fluidity and extension. It shows also, um, if you've done this yourself to a child, yes, balance a child on your hip, you were literally using your body to support a child. It shows care. It shows there's interaction here in a different way than the original Tintoretto painting we saw earlier. In the Tintoretto painting where you, you see figures laying down, now you're seeing vertical, you know, a vertical stance, people standing up, or at least Mary standing up, and holding at Jesus in this sense. But you also see something uh, rather unique. And this is what my, my wife mentioned first that caught my attention as well. Uh, thanks to Joyce on this. If we look at this Christ child, he's really happy. Uh, he's really smiling. Uh, it, it isn't a stoic face, not to use stoicism or overuse it. it, it use, it's not an impassive face or emotionless face. Th there is joy in this face. The face of the, the mother of God is a little bit different. There's a little bit of a hint of a smile. There's a little bit of a look. Note she's diagonally sort of looking down at her child. A little bit like, oh, you, you little rascal, or whatever. But there's still affection uh, in this painting. So why the significance of this? Uh, and why as it being our last piece for today? I'll bring you to page 266 in Chesterton, where he sort of, where he brings us to, if you will, one of his major lessons about Christianity. Uh, on page 266, First full paragraph, close to the bottom of the page. Chesterton writes, right in the middle of all these things stands up an enormous exception. It is quite unlike anything else. It is a thing final like the trump of doom, the trumpet of doom, though it is also a piece of good news or news that seems too good to be true. It is nothing less than the loud assertion that this mysterious maker of the world has visited this world in his world in person. It declares that really, and even recently, or right in the middle of historic times, there did walk into the world this original invisible being about whom the thinkers make theories and the mythologists hand down myths, the man who made the world. That such a higher personality exists behind all things had indeed always been implied by all the best thinkers, as well as by all the most beautiful legends. But nothing of this sort had ever been implied in any of them. Chesterton is saying there are various and many moments in history where something hearkened to the Logos himself walking the earth. There were some pretty brilliant thinkers who thought this. But they couldn't really approach this because this was still pre-revelation. This was still this was still pre-Moses, or perhaps a little bit after Moses, but still pre-Christ coming to earth. An example of this, this higher personality that is implied using Chesterton's words uh, by all the best thinkers. From Plato's Republic, there is a scene where, in Plato's Republic, where people are bound almost in chairs in a cave, and all they can see in front of them are shadows created by a fire reflecting on actual objects behind them. So they're not really seeing things, real things as they are. They are rather seeing merely uh, shadows or images, sort of false images of what these real things are. Eventually, one of these people who are bound in the cave will escape. 
He will escape. He will ascend into the world that is no longer the cave, but he will see things as they truly are. You will see trees, clouds, all sorts of things, uh, but he's only able to see them because the outside world or the real world is illuminated by the sun. It's very important from Plato, yes, if you've read Plato before. This is where he introduces the theory of forms. A form is the most perfect or ideal of what anything else is. Uh, for instance, at college, how I learned this, at St. John's College in Annapolis, we used to sit around a very long table and realize that this long table of ours was rectangular, but if you went into the other room, you'd find the same thing, but it was round. But you're still calling it the same thing. It, it shares tableness, so to speak. So pre presumably, as we were learning this as freshmen in college, there is another realm Plato is talking about where you have the perfect ideal of a table. I don't know what that's like, but all the other tables here in this world are inspired by that. It's not only tables, people as well, and great ideas as well. Truth, justice, virtue. These things are only able to be truthful, just, or virtuous because they are lit up, they are illumined, if you will, by something called the good, which corresponds to the sun that allows the person who escaped the cave to see everything else in, in the realm of real things. Now, this is what makes this tie into the story rather interesting. Christianity says that right in the middle of history, he who made the world walked in it. It was a sign of humility, the opposite of pride, and love for his creation. To dwell with them, to want fellowship with them, and vice versa. The enormous exception that Chesterton is talking about had the finality like the trumpet of doom, but bearing good news. What do we take from this? With Christianity is solved one of the great dilemmas of pagan philosophy. When you read Plato, you will read about what justice is. In fact, the Republic of Plato, his most famous dialogue, is about the central question of what exactly is justice. Where do we find it in a person? Where do we find it in a city? But there's one thing you have to know about justice. And that is, if I can bring it back again, my, my old mentor, Father James Scholl from Georgetown, he used to say that justice is a virtue, but justice is the most terrible of virtues. And what does this mean? This means that justice is very irrational. It is bound by reason. Therefore, if you live a wretched life, you will end up with a wretched end in the gutter somewhere. In the Platonic, pagan, Greek, philosophical mind, it makes perfect sense. You reap what you sow. Karma is always there. If you live a bad life, there's really very little hope for you. There are no loopholes with justice. That is why it is the most terrible of virtues. It's a good thing, but it's a very hard, unforgiving thing. What does Christianity introduce that is unique if we think of pagan Greco-Roman philosophy? It introduces something called mercy. Mercy in Christ walking the earth. Mercy in the good news. Now, mercy doesn't contradict justice. It doesn't say that justice does not have to be. Rather, oops, excuse me. Rather, what mercy does is mercy softens justice. It makes it less harsh. It makes it less unforgiving. This particular sculpture right here, showing the baby Jesus, no longer laying down, but rather now upright, ready for his task in the world. Still smiling, still the guarantor of justice, but now also able to dispense mercy, the good news. You should know that this painting right here, I'm sorry, this, this sculpture right here, like the painting you saw from Sonoma, uh, was a survivor. It was a survivor, I would, I would argue, of a much, harsh, uh, a much more harsh background than the painting of Sonoma, which went through a, a very tortuous um, path before it got to us in this presentation. Like the Sonoma painting, this statue went through a, 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 
a secularization of sorts, but a much more fatal and fierce form of secularization. It was, of course, sculpted in the 1400s. Why is that of note? The 1400s in Europe, specifically the mid-1400s, was the era of the Black Death, where a huge percentage of the European population died because of this, this horrible plague that, that, that set upon Europe. Nevertheless, somehow, the person who sculpted this had enough inspiration, had enough reverence, call it what you will, but to still sculpt something that still has a very positive message, living in a pretty bleak time, uh, you know, in, in, the, in, the, um, uh, in the 1300s. Aside from that, this sculpture survived the French Revolution, and specifically what happened in the French Revolution. In September of 1792, there were massacres over several days, wherein 1,200 prisoners were killed. Among these were over 200 priests. Along with this, there was a, a period of de-Christianization that followed during the French Revolution. This occurred right around, uh, right around that time. In October of 1793, public worship was forbidden. In the next coming months, all symbols of Christianity were removed, were pulled down, church bells were pulled down and melted, crosses were removed from churches and cemeteries. There was a widespread destruction of art, relics, and statues. It's almost a miracle this is actually still here today, owing to the French Revolution. The revolutionaries during this time were by no means unintelligent. They knew what they were doing was dismantling, taking away, and setting fire to faith. But you can't do that and leave a vacuum. They were smart enough to know you had to leave something. You had to provide something to take that gap, to, to, um, to take that space that was being opened up by the destruction, of, by the deliberate destruction of a faith. And what the revolutionaries in France decided to do was it, they decided to create their own deity, their own form of divinity that they would worship. They went back, if you will, perhaps, to the old Greco-Roman ideals of reason and justice. And they said, look, we don't want any sort of transcendent, you know, transcendent mythological religion. We want something that we can figure out with our own minds. So let's elevate reason as a god, or specifically as a goddess. Reason was, a cult of reason was created during this time, wherein churches would have their altars um, desecrated in some form or another. And in some cases, prostitutes would be placed on these altars and labeled the goddess or goddesses of reason. Now, what is interesting about this is that reason does many things for us. It is not by any means something to, um, to trivialize or, or to, um, to, to value uh, you know, it, it, not very highly. Reason is very valuable. Uh, Thomas Aquinas will say reason is one of the two wings along with faith that leads us to the truth, that guides us to the truth. Perhaps St. Paul would say similar things. Reason is something that makes us understand. But here's the thing about reason. Reason for all of its many gifts to humanity. Reason never did offer itself up for our sins. Neither did reason decide in an irrational act of mercy. And by the way, mercy is completely irrational. It does not make sense. Justice makes sense. It makes sense that if you live a life in a pretty dissipated way, you will have a dissipated end. But mercy is there to say it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that harsh. Reason, because it's rational, cannot really conscience itself doing something so irrational as to perform an act of mercy. Hence, there are very few that I know of, and perhaps I'm being a bit sarcastic, uh, cathedrals built for mercy, uh, for, for reason, I should say. Uh, that has not lasted through the centuries. And if we look at this statue of the Virgin and Child, like the Tintoretto you saw earlier, no longer horizontal, now vertical, 
but still together, still exchanging love and fellowship, still exchanging togetherness, still emphasizing that God is with humanity, the child still smiles. That is what I've taken from reading Chesterton. I have to admit, he is very different from reading Dawson, which I think I've specialized in for the last couple of years. Dawson is very much the professor, uh, is very much the academic. With Chesterton, I have to be very careful on, on these very flourishing uh, tangents he takes us to, on his brilliant use of wordplay and paradox, and, and take myself back to somehow slowly by slowly try to grasp what he's saying. Here's one last thing I'd like to, um, to bring up, though. Notice, if you will, that I began today with two Venetian greats, Tintoretto and Titian. We went from there to Masolino, who is sort of in the middle of our presentation in the 1400s, but also, by the way, considered one of the um, more famed uh, and skilled painters of the early Renaissance. But I ended, us, uh, ended the presentation with the painting from the Sonoma Mission and the also uh, unknown artist sculpted sculpture of the Madonna and child. By this, we are actually doing a little bit of homage, uh, homage to what Chesterton is saying in the first part of the book he did last week. Chesterton is saying it, it doesn't progress all the time from primitive to advanced. It doesn't work that way. Sometimes you can tell the greatest story ever told by ironically, artistically, going from more advanced, Tintoret and Titian, to works of art that we don't even know who performed, who produced them. So the progression is not as important as the story. The story is what binds. The story is what inspires. It isn't a historical possession because history itself relies on the reference of something that is beyond history to give it greater meaning. That's what I have for all today.